the song that I sing. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I you are the words in the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. Song number 338. <coughs> Song number 338. <coughs> Lord, we come before thee. come to you in thanks for this time of worship that's set aside to join with our brothers and sisters in Christ and we pray that everything that's done and said here this morning be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We thank you for the, the awesome beauty of this world that you've created and entrusted us with and we pray that we will always be good stewards of your world, not exploit and abuse it, but respect and appreciate the, the incredible power that was used to create it. We thank you for the gift of your son and his willingness to take on the sins of the world and for the hope that we have of eternal life through him. Father, we thank you for this congregation of believers and, and for what we mean to each other. Help us, help us to always support and encourage each other so that we may all see your kingdom someday. Help each of us to, to see the potential we have to, to spread the gospel and to, to use our talents to the best of our abilities. Father, we pray your healing on those who, who suffer from physical afflictions that might prevent them from serving you in their fullest capacity. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, who, who suffer from the, the pain and the heartache that such a loss will bring on. We pray for those who struggle with, with addictions and, and substance abuse. And 
and for those dealing with emotional struggles and family issues. Father, we just we lay all of these problems at your feet, and we, we pray for your comfort and your healing. <clears throat> Father, be with us as we go through this service. Help us open our hearts and, and listen to your word so that we might gain a deeper understanding of your will for our lives. Help us to take your word from this place and, and out into our community and share it with those who need to know of, of your love and your plan of salvation. <clears throat> Father, we pray for our country and, and for its enemies, both, both inside and outside our borders, for those who wish to, to tear down its Christian founding and re replace it with, with more government. Touch the hearts of our enemies and, and help them to understand that nothing happens without your knowledge, that our time here is fleeting and, and temporary, and that you are alive and in control. We pray for our leaders. Help them to always look to you for guidance and strength. Help us all to remember that, that the rights we enjoy come from you, not from man or government. We pray that we would never take these rights for granted, but use them to further your kingdom. Help us in the days ahead to seek you daily in all things, to consult you in every decision that we make. And, and Father, when we choose wrongly and sin against you, we, we just beg for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace, for your love, and for the hope that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ. It's through him that we pray. Amen. Amen.
Lord God in heaven, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that we can gather around this table and partake of these emblems in remembrance of thy Son, our Lord and Savior. Bless this bread, Father, for to us it represents the body of Christ. Help us to partake of it in a manner pleasing unto thee. These things we pray in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege we have to gather around our table. Thank you for this food that I am here to us. And my blood said of Christ, I say that we are now in the manner which we do this. We pray in the end of our sight. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.
nice day that you've given us today and thank you for the nice weather we've had the past couple of days. And we just want to give back a portion of what you so richly blessed us with and we want to thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us. Thank you for letting us be here today and sing praise to you and learn more about you. And please let us take the knowledge that Ben is going to give us today and use that in our lives for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing song number 525. Song number 525. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work till the close of the day, I shall see the great King in His beauty. Today's scripture comes from Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. I will be reading from the NIV. 
Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good for, to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Brother Ben. Well, good morning. Thank you, Jonah. We are, uh, you got to take a look around and see the time change and or spring break has took a hit on us this morning. You know, I posted on our Facebook page yesterday that there was a time change and that was not an excuse to miss church this morning. But I know that we have a lot of people that are out of town also. It's a spring break for uh, several of the schools in the area and we've got a lot of folks out traveling. So please keep them in your uh, prayers as we... Uh, as we uh, go through our day and this coming week and people that will be traveling and stuff as well. If you've got your Bibles with you, open them up over to the book of Colossians. We're going to start there here in just a second. That passage that Jonah started, in, uh, started us out with this morning over in the book of Galatians, that is a, uh, a fantastic passage of Scripture where the Apostle Paul is telling the church in Galatia, for us to not grow weary, do not grow weary in doing good, for you will reap a harvest in the time to come, and that we should be doing good to all people, especially those of the members of the household of faith. It's a fantastic passage of Scripture telling us not to grow tired, not to grow weary, not to get worn out on what we're doing for God. And sometimes it gets easy to get weary, doesn't it? Sometimes it's easy to get worn out, isn't it? Sometimes it's easy to get a little bit burned out, isn't it? That we can run along so fast and so hard sometimes that we do just get tired. And that we do just get weary. So it's great that the Apostle Paul gives us this passage in the book of Galatians reminding us, don't grow weary. Just keep on going. Keep on trucking because you will reap a harvest when the time comes. So don't stop. Don't back down. Just buck up and keep on running. But it's easy sometimes to become weary. It's easy sometimes to become tired. But you know what's even easier to happen to us sometimes? It's even easier sometimes, and most of the time, for us to get comfortable. You notice the title to this morning's sermon is The Comfortable Christian, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning. We're not going to talk about the tired Christian. We're not going to talk about the weary Christian. We're not going to talk about the burned out Christian. What we're going to talk about is the comfortable Christian. We all like to be comfortable, don't we? Comfort is something that we look forward to in our lives. We want to be comfortable. We have our favorite spots in our house. I've got my recliner. If I can ever keep Brenda out of it, that is my favorite spot. It's my most comfortable spot. Maybe you've got a corner in your couch that, that you've got molded down that fits you perfect, and that's where you're most comfortable. Or you've got your own pillow that even when you travel, you've got to take that pillow with you because you can only get comfortable with that pillow. Or when we get in our cars to go somewhere, what's one of the first things that we do is, especially if our wife's been driving it before we get on there, we get in there and you start messing with that little seat button, right? You got to get your legs right and get your back right and get your seat settled in right so that you can be nice and comfortable. We like comfort and there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to be comfortable and it's good to be comfortable Christians. It's good to be comfortable in our Christianity. But one of the problems with getting comfortable, and one of the problems with getting too comfortable, is that we begin to take things for granted. And when we start to do things in a repetitive manner, when we start getting into a, a, a mode of repetition that we're doing things over and over and over, and we get comfortable in that repetition, what happens is, is our comfort sometimes causes us to miss out on the big picture. It's like if, you, if you're driving a journey and you're going a long ways and you get comfortable in the seat of the car, you might start to miss out on some of the journey just because it's a long journey and you're so comfortable. I remember when I, uh, when I worked for General Electric down in Dallas. It was a 72-mile drive from my driveway to the parking lot of the distribution center that I worked in. It's 144 miles round trip every day. And I did that for almost 18 years. So I would get in my car every morning, early in the morning, and I would head out and go to Dallas. And this, when I first started this, this was, uh, 
This was before I-35 became a Mad Max marathon. This was when you would leave Gainesville and it was almost like a nice country drive until you got all the way down into Denton and all down to the south side of Denton towards Louisville in there. And it was a nice, easy drive. And I would get in that car early in the morning. I'd head down there in the afternoon. I'd get in it and I'd head back. And I did that for so many years, and I got so comfortable making that drive. Now, how many of us, I know we've got people here that make commutes like that. How many of us have made commutes like that over and over and over, and we've got so comfortable making that commute that you can literally drive it and not remember anything about the commute? I mean, really. There were times that I would leave work in Dallas and get in my truck, and the next thing I knew, I was exiting off on 82 in Gainesville. And I would think to myself, where was Valley View? I don't even remember driving through Sanger. Did I cross the Louisville Bridge? But I was so comfortable in what I was doing. And I had driven it so many times, day after day after day, that what had happened was I had got into a zone to where I was missing out on everything that was going around me. Now that's one of the dangers that we have in becoming comfortable Christians. Now, don't get me wrong, I want us to be comfortable Christians. I want us to be so comfortable in our Christianity that it is repetitive, that it is a habit, that we are, that we, we have, we wear our Christianity as quickly when we get out of bed in the morning as anything else, that we are comfortable in our Christianity, but not so comfortable that we begin to miss out. I heard a great story here a while back about a, about a, a, a little town of ducks, and all of these ducks, they lived in this little duck town. And every Sunday, all the ducks would get together and they would go to their duck church. And they'd come out of their houses and they'd waddle down the street and head to duck church. Quack, 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 this, heading to duck church. And they would get to church and they would come in. Well, one Sunday they all came in and they sat down in their little duck pews. And the duck preacher, he waddled down the aisle and he waddled up to the pulpit. And he began to preach about the fact that, you know, we're ducks. We can fly. And as ducks, we should be spreading our wings and we should be flying. And he pounded his beak on the pulpit up there and he said, we should go out and fly because as ducks we can fly. God has created us to spread our wings, to get up there with the eagles, to be in the clouds and to fly. And all of the ducks in the audience, they were amening. They were quacking amening. And when the sermon was done, he came down from the pulpit and he went back to the back and all the ducks were leaving. And as they came by, they were quack, 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 fantastic sermon. Great sermon, minister. We love that sermon. Yes, we're born to fly. And they all walked out and they all waddled home. <laughs> you know why? Because they got in the habit of waddling. And they were comfortable with their waddling and they had totally forgot. We're really created that we could fly. One of the problems that we have if we become comfortable Christians is that we begin to forget some of the most basic things. Not that we forget them, but that we just run along on an autopilot and we almost begin to ignore them. Because I'm getting all my basics in. You know, I read my Bible and, and I go to church on Sundays, go on Wednesday nights, I, you know, I pray. I'm doing, I'm doing all the things, but we're trucking along and, and where's our mind at while we're doing all of this? because we've got so comfortable that we just do it without thinking about what we're doing. Well, this passage that we're going to look at over here in the book of Colossians, Colossians, the third chapter, this is a fantastic passage of Scripture. We're going to read 17 verses this morning, so go ahead and turn over there. Take your little page marker here that you've got and put in there, because we're going to bounce to a couple other places as we go through those 17 verses. But we're going to spend primarily most of our time this morning over in Colossians chapter 3 in these first 17 verses, because we're going to look at the basics. We're going to kind of get back to three basics that, that even as comfortable Christians, we can never forget. And that we can't get ourselves flying along on autopilot and begin to ignore these things that Paul talks about over here to the church in Colossae. Now when Paul is writing this letter to the church in Colossae, he's writing to a group of established Christians. He's writing to a group of Christians that's very close to him. He's writing to a group of Christians that are doing the right things. But in the third chapter, before he begins to wrap this letter up, the Apostle Paul feels it necessary to remind the Colossians of some things that they need to be doing. And, and in an effort to remind them to do these things, what he's doing is he's, he's telling them, even when you're comfortable as a Christian, don't forget the things that you need to be doing. And the first one that he talks about, look over here with me in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, starting in the very first verse. Paul writes, Since then 
You have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So here's number one, basic. Is where is our mind at? Where are we looking, and what are we concentrating on? The Apostle Paul, writing this letter to a group of committed Christians that he loves dearly, before he ends the letter, he says, Therefore, think about this. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. Do you know one of the problems that we have when we become really comfortable Christians and we just start going through the motions and we start just going through the repetitive courses of it? One of the things that happens to us is our minds begin to wander off in different places. And it's just like when you're making that long drive from Dallas to Gainesville and you get to exit, you know, Highway 82 and you start exiting off and think to myself, I don't remember that drive. Where was my mind? My mind was on a million other things. There's no telling where my mind was at. What am I going to have for dinner tonight? You know, the Cowboys are going to win this weekend. I wonder what's coming on television. I wonder this, I wonder that. You know, I'm thinking a million things going in a different, million different directions. The Apostle Paul says, don't get so comfortable in your life that you begin to forget about what's really important and where your mind is at. And he tells us, he says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. What do we think about when we set our, things on, our minds on things above? What are we going to be setting our minds on? Are we thinking about the clouds? Are we thinking about the moon and the stars and the sun? Are those the things that Paul's talking about us setting our minds on? No. Set our minds on Jesus Christ. And he reminds us as Christians, when you were baptized, what happened was you died to your old life and you have raised up as a whole new creation. And he said, you died to that old life. Now set your minds on the things that are important. And those are the things that are above. What do we put our minds on in this world? You know, we can get so comfortable in our Christianity that just like the drive, it begins to go to the back of the mind and everything else is in the forefront. I've got the bills to pay. I've got the doctor's appointments to keep. I've got the, the appointment at work that I've got to keep. I've got to, get to, I've got to get to the job tomorrow. I've got to get the kids here. I've got to get the kids there. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to do so many things. Our minds can get so jumbled up with so much. But he says, remember this, Jesus Christ who came and died for you, set your minds on Him. Place your minds on things above and not on the things of this world. You remember Dennis the Menace? Dennis the Menace, the great cartoon strip. And I, I don't know, I don't get a paper anymore. I guess Dennis the Menace is still in the cartoons. I don't know, but he's been there. Been there for years and years and years. But you remember Dennis the Menace and his best friend Joey. He had his little best friend named Joey. And who can forget his next door neighbors? Mr. and Mrs. Wilson. Well, Dennis was a thorn in Mr. Wilson's side. Mr. Wilson was uh, the grumpy little old man that lived next door. And him and Dennis never saw eye to eye on anything. But Mrs. Wilson was the angel. And little Joey was the guy that just hung out with Dennis. And whatever trouble Dennis got into, Joey was there. Well... There was one cartoon strip with Dennis the Menace where Dennis and Joey go over to Mr. and Mrs. Wilson's house and they bang on the door. Mr. Wilson home and Mrs. Wilson says, nope, he's not here right now, but I'm just baking some cookies. You boys want some cookies? And they go in and they eat a bunch of cookies. And in the next frame, they're walking down the street. They've each got a big old cookie and, and Dennis is eating on his cookie and, and Joey says, why do you think Mrs. Wilson gave us these cookies when we're not so nice? And Dennis says, she didn't give us these cookies because we're nice. She gave us these cookies because she's nice. You know what? Set your things on your minds on things above where we have a God who regardless of the things that we have done, when we're not so nice, sent his son to come down here and die for us. This is the cornerstone of everything that we hold dear. It's that God sent his son to come down here and die on the cross for us, not because we were so nice, and not because we deserved it, and not because we worked so hard for it, but because He is a loving God and wants all of us to come back to Him. 
So we can't get so comfortable in our lives that number one, what we're doing is, is that we're running through this life and we're forgetting what's above. You know what the author of Hebrews writes over in the book of Hebrews? Over in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in the second verse, the author of Hebrews writes, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinful men that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't get so comfortable that we, that we lose track of fixing our eyes on Jesus who came and endured that scorn and that shame and that pain, not because we were so good, but because God loves us so much. So number one, keep your minds in the right place. The second thing that the Apostle Paul talks about over here in the book of Colossians, starting in verse 5 of chapter 3, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Do you know what part two is? Part one is don't forget to look up. Part two is that we need to look in. We need to take an inventory of ourselves and we need to do it consistently. We need to do it daily. The Apostle Paul's writing the church in Colossae here and what he tells the church in Colossae is, as Christians, here's what you need to get rid of. All of these things. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. He says, get rid of your, all these things such as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Be honest, don't lie to each other. Take off your old self and its practices. We look up and then we look in. And we need to do some self-examination. And folks, if you ever want to get really uncomfortable, give yourself a good, long, hard, honest exam. Examine yourselves good, long, and hard, and honest about the things that you have inside and the things that we do. You know, back in the book of Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah in Lamentations 3, he said, let us examine ourselves and return to the Lord. The Apostle Paul over in 2 Corinthians 13 said, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Self-examination is good for us to take the time out and see, have I got so comfortable that I've started slipping back into the world? You know, Paul is writing this to a group of committed Christians. And he's telling them, take a look at yourself. And if you've got any of this in there, you need, to, you need to drive a stake through the heart of it. You need to kill it. Put to death all of this stuff that may be crawling around inside of you. This self-examination isn't an examination where we go take a look at ourselves in the mirror. We do that every day. Most of the time, we do it several times a day. We walk by a mirror and we stop. Yeah, I'm looking pretty good. I got my tie straight. My lipstick's on right. Everything's good. Every person in here, you all examined yourself this morning. Don't tell me you didn't. Y'all look too good to have not. <laughs> you examined yourself this morning. You looked in the mirror and made sure everything out here looked good. I remember when Sean Sutton, the first time he preached for me, he was really nervous. It was the first time he had preached here. and He, he, he asked me, he said, you got, you got any advice for me for, uh, for preaching? And I said, yeah, make sure your fly's zipped up. He said, that's it. I said, honest, man. <laughs> but that's an external examination, isn't it? Let me, let me look and see how I look on the outside and how I appear to other people on the outside. Nobody knows you like you. And nobody knows me like me. And the Apostle Paul, well, Jesus does, and we're going to get to that here in just a second. But the Apostle Paul says, if you've got any of this stuff in you, and he's writing to Christians, if you've got any of this stuff in you, if you... If you've got immorality in you, if you've got lust in you, if you've got sexual desires in you that you shouldn't have, if you've got greed in you, if you've got dishonesty in you, if you've got this stuff in you, drive a stake through it. You need to kill it. Examine yourself. A long, hard, honest self-examination. What do I need to do? 
And I tell you what, that's going to keep you from getting too comfortable. Because it's a daily struggle. It's a daily struggle for us to live our lives the way that we ought to live our lives. In this world today, we're surrounded by so much. And it's so easy to slip and slide and fall. And it's what's on the inside that really matters. Now, we're a good-looking bunch here this morning, but Jesus is looking at what's on the inside. Look in your Bibles over to the book of Matthew. Over to Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Matthew, the 23rd chapter, starting in the 25th verse. Jesus has been dealing with the, uh, with the Pharisees, uh, the religious leaders of the day. They were not happy with Him. They didn't like Him. They, you know, religion was their thing. They had this cornered, and they didn't like this new upstart that had showed up and started teaching people a new way to get back to God, which wasn't a new way at all. It was a way that had been prophesied for thousands of years. They just failed to see it. But they refused to listen to him, and he was constantly having this debate back and forth with them because they were the religious leaders. And look at what Jesus says to them over in Matthew chapter 23, starting in the 25th verse. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. You know, that's what I was talking about. Nobody knows you like you, except Jesus. We can put on all of the outward appearance, but Jesus knows what's going on on the inside. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of the law, all those teachers, all those religious figures back then, they had everything going on on the outside. And Jesus says, but I know what's really on the inside. You're filled with all of this greed. You're filled with all of this power mongering that you want. You're filled with all of this lust. You're filled with all of it. That's all on the inside. You can look great on the outside, but you're just like a whitewashed tomb. It's beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, it's just full of dead men's bones and everything that's unclean. I thought about this scripture last week because I went and I got gas in my truck. And after I got done getting gas in my truck, I ran it through the car wash. And I got home after I ran it through the car wash and I parked it and I got out and I was walking in the house and I turned around and I glanced at it and I thought, yeah, that's an old truck, but it's still not too bad looking when it's cleaned up. And then I thought to myself, oh, woe to you, Ben. Though your truck is clean on the outside, the inside is filled with dog hair and old coffee cups. <laughs> Our lives be the same way. We look out great on the outside. And Jesus calls it out on the Pharisees because He knows what's on the inside. We need to have some serious self-examination. And that's one of the things that's going to keep us from getting so comfortable that we lose track. It's something we need to do it daily. Let me examine myself and let me look and see where I'm at. And then the third thing this morning, the final thing from over in Colossians chapter 3, starting in the 11th verse, Paul says, Here there is no Greek, nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another, with all wisdom as you sing songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You know what the third thing is? First thing is we need to be looking up. The second thing is, is we need to be looking in. And the third thing is, is we need to be looking out. Do you notice this last passage of Scripture here, these verses that we just read, have to do with how we're dealing with other people? He says, if you've got sin in your life, in part two, kill it and get rid of it. Because after you kill it and get rid of it, what you can do is that you can clothe yourself 
holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Bear and forgive each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Put on love. Be honest to each other. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. This third part has to do with how we're going out. You know, we need to look up. We need to look in, but then we need to look out. How are we dealing with other people? Are we a people of compassion? Are we a people of love? Are we a people of grace? And I like to think that here at the Callisburg Church, we really are. But at the same time, what can happen in our lives is that we can get so comfortable in our Christianity and so comfortable in our lives that we forget that we should be clothed in this and wearing this all the time. I had to run into a story yesterday at a, a funeral that I was going to. And I had to run in a store and pick up one little package, uh, some items at this uh, a store in town here. And I ran in and I was running a little bit late. And when I got in there, there was only one person at the, at the checkout line. I thought, that's great. I get in here and get out. I grabbed the one item that I needed. And I got up to checkout line. And the lady that was in front of me was a Hispanic lady. And she was buying a rug. And she had the rug laying up there. And the girl that was waiting on her, the girl rang it up. And, okay, that's seventeen ninety-five or whatever it was. And she said, do you have a rewards card with us? And the Hispanic lady said, mm, yes, I think. And she said, do you have it with you? And she said, oh, I don't think, but I think maybe. I'm, I'm, my English is not so good. She said, well, can I get your email address? So she gave her email address four times because she couldn't get it. And I was standing behind them with my one item going. And then she said, well, what we'll do is I'll sign you up for a rewards card right now. And she gets a piece of paper and she lays it down and she says, fill out, write out your email address. And the, and the lady tells her, she said, I'm, I'm, my English is not so good. I'm working on my English. It's not so good. I, I write it down. She writes down her email address for her. She write down your phone number, and the whole time, I'm standing behind her going, I go, I go, I go. I'll pay the $17. <laughs> I'll pay the 17 and give you 17 Take your rug and go. Just, I got to go. Well, she gets it all wrote down. She gives it to the lady. The lady enters it into the computer. She gets a little plastic card out and she scans it and she hands it to her with a piece of paper. And she says, okay, now this is your rewards card. And she starts circling things on the paper with her pen. Right here tells you how to use it and what you'll get from it and what you can get here. And then she gets a receipt and she lays it down. She goes, now right here, you can go online and you can take a survey. And when you take this survey, please tell them, and she writes her name down, that I helped you and let them know how I did. And I'm standing behind her saying, you want me to let them know how you're doing? <laughs> no, wait a second, folks. I'm the preacher. I'm a Christian. What did the Apostle Paul have to say? Here, there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, Hispanic, English-speaking, non-English-speaking. Okay, he doesn't have that in there, but I'm going to put it in. What did the Apostle Paul say? As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Who was patient there? The lady behind the counter. I don't speak English so good. I'm working on it. The lady behind the counter said, let me help you. Let me give you a piece of paper and you write it down for me. And we'll take our time and we'll do this because I want you to get the best deal that you can possibly get. I'm trying. I'll take care of it for you. Folks, how we represent ourselves and how we handle ourselves in this world speaks volumes about our Christianity. It really does. So here's the thing. We need, to, you, we need to look up and keep our mind on things above. We need to look in and do some serious self-examination every now and then. And we need to look out and see what we're spreading out to the world. 
Because when it's all said and done, what is our mission? When it's all said and done, our mission is not to just get comfortable. Our mission is to spread the gospel. And sometimes we can spread the gospel by just being the best Christians that we can be. And sometimes we're the only sermon that people will ever see. And above all of these things, the Apostle Paul says, is to put on love. John said, we love because he first loved us. And how much did he love us? That he'd go to the cross and die for us so, so, so that there wouldn't be Greek, non-Greek, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, circumcised, uncircumcised, Hispanic, white, black. He went so that we all would have that opportunity because that's how much he loves all of mankind. Now I'm going to close this out this morning because I know I'm running a little long. But there was a book that was written a few years ago by a doctor named Richard Seltzer. And the name of the book was Mortal Lessons, Notes on the, Arts of, on the Art of Surgery. And he talked about different lessons, life lessons that he learned as a surgeon throughout his career. And he wrote about a young lady that had came in and she had a tumor that had grown. And they had to remove the tumor. And the way that it had grown was it had got onto some nerves in her face. And when they removed the tumor, they knew we're going to have to cut these nerves. And she won't have control of that side of her face after we do. And they went in and they did the surgery and they removed the tumor and they cut those nerves. And when she began to heal up, this side of her face drooped and she had no control over it. And she was a newlywed and her husband came in and was visiting with her after the surgery and after they had removed some of the bandages. And he writes in his book, Dr. Seltzer does, he says, her young husband came into the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to do well in the evening lamplight, isolated from me and the private. What are they, I ask myself? Who are they? He and this wry mouth that I have made, who gaze at each other and touch each other so generously and so greedily. The young woman speaks, will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will. It's because we had to cut that nerve. She nods and she's silent. But the young man, he smiles and he says, I like it. He says, it's kind of cute. And unmindful of me, he bends down and he kisses her crooked mouth. And I'm so close that I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers to show her that their kiss will always work. Folks, we're all broken. We're all twisted. We're all hurt. And do you know what Jesus Christ did? He formed Himself to come down here and be like us so that He could lead us home. That's the love that He has for us. So let's not get so comfortable that we forget that. Let's not get so comfortable that our mind is on the things of this world and not on things above. Let's not get so comfortable that we never think we need to take some self-examination and see what's going on in our lives. Let's not get so comfortable that we forget that we may be the only sermon that people out there ever see in our actions and the way that we live our lives. You know how the Apostle Paul ended that passage this morning that we read over in verse 17 of Colossians chapter 3? He said, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't become so comfortable that we forget that. But maybe you're in a position in your life this morning that you have not felt that touch of Jesus Christ in your life. Maybe you haven't given your life over to Him. I want to encourage you today to do that. I want to encourage you today to become one of His. When Paul wrote this letter, he was writing it to a group of committed Christians. If you're here this morning and you're a committed Christian, let's not get so comfortable that we forget to look up and look in and spread out. If you're with us this morning and you have not committed your life to Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do so. He is waiting for you. The Bible tells us that we do that by believing that He is the Son of God, by confessing His name before man, by repenting of our sins, and by being baptized for the remission of those sins. If you haven't taken those steps, I encourage you this morning to please take those steps, become one of His. And if you have taken those steps and we can help you this morning with prayer, we certainly want to be able to do that. We're going to sing a song of invitation. We want to encourage and invite 
Anyone that's here with us this morning, if we can help with prayer, if we can offer baptism to you today, we want to be able to do that. All that we ask is that you come to the front while we sing. Let's all stand and sing, please. today to worship you, to uh, hear your word proclaimed, and as we depart now, may we continue each day in our lives to always look inward as we lift our prayers upward to you, that outwardly that our example, our life in Christ shows and is evident to others. Continue with us as we pray this prayer through Christ. Amen. Amen.